Chapter 1, The New Racial Etiquette, The Ritual of Racial Reprimand In the book The Content of Our Character, Shelby Steele describes what he calls a new public choreography of black and white under integration. He recalls a dinner party on a warm, windless California evening where a racially mixed group mellowed out over a pleasant meal, drinks, and trusting self-disclosure. Then a jarring note rang out. A black engineer turned the conversation to the issue of race with accusation in his voice. He spoke of his irritation that his daughter was only one of three black children at her school. I didn't realize my ambition to get ahead would pull me into a world where my daughter would lose touch with her blackness. The effect of this assertion was stunned silence, but the man persisted in his truculent demeanor. Awkward and at a loss for what to say, the guests soon leapt. This is Steele's autopsy of the party, death induced by an abrupt and lethal injection of the American race issue. Steele interprets this scene as a reenactment of the harangue flagellation ritual well known at the end of the 1960s and early 1970s when the civil rights movement had shifted to the more militant notions of black power and black identity. He forsakes and chastises such behavior now, despite occasionally getting a faint itch for it, but at the time he too enjoyed the cheap thrills to be gained from intentionally provocative behavior or incendiary talk about race, particularly in interracial settings. In those days, quote, it was such great fun to pinion some professor or housewife, or best of all, a large group of remorseful whites, with the knowledge of both their racism and their denial of it. In Steele's account, such behavior was simply a means of pulling rank, a power play, by inducing white guilt. But there is nothing simple about it today. It has indeed become part of a larger and even more troublesome attitude that Steele associates with the insecurities and the crises of confidence in the black middle class's adaptation to integration. In recent decades, racial anxiety has been transformed into an unanxious racialism, as many blacks seek a way of holding on to race rather than risk being judged by universal measures of character or achievement. Whether or not one agrees with Steele's explanation, it would be difficult for a conscientious observer of contemporary American culture to deny that the harangue flagellation ritual and other such scripts have become part of the texture of integration. To be sure, we can also laugh at such scenes, as popular culture makes abundantly clear, and the premature death of a mellow night of California self-disclosure may not be such a bad thing. Yet, not all of the rituals of race under integration are so benign, nor are the consequences of those rituals insignificant. They can seep into our thinking and set the terms in which an event or behavior is understood. They influence everything from how the problems of the black family can be discussed to the images of black men that appear in the media. These rituals affect and sometimes severely compromise the effectiveness of movements to improve race relations and living conditions for African Americans and others. Indeed, an exploration of racial rituals broadly conceived, our unwritten expectations, our taboos, our notions of proper etiquette, helps to pinpoint the ways in which we have failed thus far in some of the most important tests of integration. In arenas like sports, entertainment, and the military, there is often much to suggest that we are serious about accepting and embracing the racially mixed nature of the American citizenry. In places like counties, neighborhoods, and schools, however, we often see the legacy of our problems in continued racial separation. If the commitment to integration and equality is to triumph permanently over the inherited mental and spatial structures that keep us apart, we must reconsider the terms on which our integrated social life rests to be certain we are creating a foundation sturdy enough to support long-lasting change. Black Assertion, White Submission Black assertiveness or expressiveness and white submission, restraint, or acquiescence have been honed into styles of self-presentation so familiar in American life under integration that the mere reference to this dynamic is guaranteed to produce at bare minimum a tremor of recognition, if not outright hilarity. One of the most memorable scenes in any 1990s American film, not just those involving race, was the show me the money scene in the film Jerry Maguire. In this scene, a black football star played by Cuba Gooding Jr. harangues his white sports agent played by today's highest paid Hollywood actor Tom Cruise and Cruz's character responds with total submission. The scene gives a perfect, if extreme, illustration of the harangue flagellation ritual that has become a familiar aspect of the cultural landscape of integrated America. Before the scene opens, Cruz's character, Jerry Maguire, undergoes a late-night epiphany about his profession, deciding that he has lost touch with the real essence of sports, the love of the game, in his pursuit of the largest sums of money he can command for his clients. In a frenzy of inspiration, he types up a memo and deposits copies in the mailboxes of all of his co-workers, who don false but temporary expressions of admiration for his virtue. Soon afterward, the young upstart company boss, whom Maguire initially trained, takes him out to lunch and fires him on the spot. Maguire storms out of the restaurant and rushes back to his office to call each of his clients. He aims to win as many clients away from the company as possible so that he can go into business for himself. While he talks to his clients, viewers see Maguire's boss talking on the phone with the same people, succeeding in nearly every case to keep them with the company. One of Maguire's clients, though, does not hang up on him. This is the football star Rod Tidwell, played by Cuba Gooding. 
What ensues is a highly entertaining and now renowned scene in which Tidwell keeps McGuire on the phone during the pivotal period in which McGuire loses valuable clients each minute he fails to answer their calls. Tidwell slows down the intense tempo of the film and makes McGuire and us concentrate solely on him and his family's situation. He makes McGuire jump through hoop after hoop with only a remote possibility that he will remain McGuire's client. The hoops get more and more absurd until Tidwell has McGuire repeating after him his family's motto, show me the money. Starting off quietly, McGuire repeats the phrase until he is shouting at the top of his lungs. Completely visible in his glassed-in office and now audible, McGuire's surrender to Tidwell's outrageous demands draws the attention of the entire company. As the conversation reaches a climax, with Tidwell smiling and strutting around his house to loud music and McGuire yelling each phrase Tidwell wants him to, Tidwell asks, Do you love this black man? I love the black man, shouts McGuire. I love black people, says Tidwell. I love black people, shouts McGuire. Who's your motherfucker, shouts Tidwell. You're my motherfucker, shouts McGuire. What you gonna do, Jerry, asks Tidwell. Show me the money, screams McGuire. Congratulations, you're still my agent, Tidwell says with a cocky grunt, cutting off the music and abruptly hanging up the phone. The resonance of scenes like these has everything to do with the rise since the 1960s of a new confusion about the appropriate way to behave in interracial settings and an attempt to address that confusion through an etiquette of race. Certainly this extreme assertiveness by blacks and total submission by whites is not the rule in everyday American life. This dramatization is extreme by any measure, a hyperbolic treatment aimed at comic results. At least part of its humor has to do with the way it evokes and subverts the inhumane code of behavior under slavery and Jim Crow, white supremacy, and enforced black submission. However, it also plays on the audience's awareness of a more recent interracial dynamic that emerged in some parts of the culture under integration. It is a syndrome of white liberal guilt and black self-assertion that became prominent in the mid to late 1960s as the civil rights coalition lost its cohesiveness and direction and has since become a stock theme in our popular culture. Although we can laugh at it in movies, this new interracial complex deserves serious attention. It simplifies the remaining problems we face that have to do with race, not least by perpetuating the false dichotomy of white and black in the first place. A great deal of energy has gone into the endeavor to establish what common sense should have long ago, that beyond a notion of shared genetic pools that explains general similarities within ethnic groups, race has little concrete existence, particularly in the stark sense of black and white. People of mixed race, like the golf champion Tiger Woods, have made it clear that even as a cultural construction, race often has little salience for those of mixed parentage. The recent debate over whether racial categories should continue to be used in the U.S. census brought into question the future of the black-white racial distinction. The harangue flagellation ritual is just one of a larger set of stock roles Americans have come to expect. The journalist and Northwestern University political science professor Adolf Reed Jr. wrote in reference to Tiger Woods, for instance, that the notion that black athletes should be held to higher standards because of their obligations as spokespersons and role models was, quote, unreasonable and unfair. Still, Steele's harangue flagellation ritual, whereby blacks ostensibly take the upper hand, does seem to characterize, if not explain, the behavior of some leaders in the public eye and the public's willingness to give them a hearing. The Reverend Al Sharpton is but one example of someone who falls in line with this ritual by playing the race card at every opportunity. From racial protocol to civil rights and back again. The ritual portrayed so strikingly by Cruz and Gooding zeroes in on the way in which Americans, faced with the sudden overthrow of the social code of segregation, failed to translate the universalism of the civil rights movement into a guide for behavior under integration. Cultural changes beyond the civil rights movement helped put in question our sense of the proper underpinnings for the treatment of other citizens, mutualism, respect, integrity, fairness, dignity, the golden rule, about which the civil rights movement was so certain. The 1960s also witnessed the counterculture's questioning of all authority and pretense, the revolt against formality and etiquette as relics of elitism, and the increasingly uncivil social relations and self-obsession of advanced consumer capitalism. In this context, the very real question of how a society with deeply differential, racialized codes of behavior would adapt to integration and equality was solved only partially and uneasily. New codes of interracial etiquette sought to reverse the old patterns of racial deference by itemizing endless numbers of new rules, an endeavor that produced unintended consequences for American race relations. Attempting to address the conundrum of race under integration in significant part through etiquette, Americans became deeply mired in a set of assumptions and practices from which it was increasingly difficult to extricate themselves. The new interracial etiquette gurus stepped eagerly to the fore, giving their own theories and advice, nearly always helping to undermine faith in the possibilities for a universal code of behavior. They often based their ideas on the existence of separate, basic black and white identities that mandated different behavior treatment and social roles. Even more important, they helped ensure that the civil rights movement would be reoriented away from the realm of politics, civic, and business life where it began and where the worst inequalities remain. Casting interracial problems as issues of etiquette put a premium on superficial symbols of good intentions and good motivations, as well as on style and appearance rather than on the substance of change. 
There is some irony in the persistence of such themes in a society that just one generation ago underwent the civil rights revolution. That movement not only tore down the legalized caste system that relegated blacks to a separate and inferior social status and attacked informal discrimination, it also delivered a frontal assault on the entire cultural apparatus that buttressed and rationalized Jim Crow and de facto segregation with its rigidly differential treatment and protocol. Building on important precedents of earlier agitation, the movement exposed the heinous race-sex complex that undergirded the rigid southern social etiquette of white supremacy, under which a misplaced glance seemed to many whites to constitute a violation tantamount to rape, drawing swift retribution from a lynch mob. At the same time, the civil rights movement questioned the North's extra-legal conceptions of turf ownership that made unwitting trespass, even by a child at play, explode into recrimination, retribution, and riot. The civil rights era activists and later scholars made it common knowledge just how much race relations had become ritualized under the violent reign of slavery and segregation, and just how brutal a stranglehold the etiquette of race managed to maintain on everyday social life. The civil rights crusade sought to confront the nation's crimes against humanity by rooting out the double standards ingrained in every aspect of daily life. Separate and inferior schools and public facilities, lies and myths about black inferiority perpetuated under the banner of hard science and social science, unshakable rules for behavior that maintained a rigid social hierarchy. The totality of white victimization of blacks had expressed itself not only in economic and political arrangements, but also in elaborate social codes, which black parents were forced to teach their children for sheer survival. Generation after generation was thus socialized anew into the inherently unfair, dehumanizing world that was once America. It was precisely the moral objections to this way of life raised by Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights leaders that resonated to a vast number of Americans and ensured drastic change. King appealed constantly to universal rights and dignity as well as unity and interdependence when he called on Americans to make real the promises of democracy. These promises were embodied, he said, in the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, which announced that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. King's I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington in 1963 invoked the nation's sacred obligation to rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. His legendary words made the implications of this universalism concrete, comprehensible, and compelling. I have a dream my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. The unrelentingly moral logic that caused King to emphasize character with its connotations of self-discipline and obligation to the common good had everything to do with the movement's success in attacking the brutal hypocrisy and racial double standard of segregation. What has not received sustained analysis is what happened to racial etiquette in the era of integration. While civil rights brought tremendous improvements in conditions for African Americans and many others, the new racial protocol that emerged in the late 1960s helped steer it off track. Although the new etiquette hardly causes all remaining problems regarding race, it constrains how these problems can be faced and reflects our larger difficulties, tensions, and uncertainties about the very foundations of our collective life. A classic film articulated race relations in the language of the etiquette of integration and began to explore the possibilities of the emerging new model of black assertiveness and white submission. Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, released in 1967, depicted a young, ingenious white woman, played by Katherine Houghton, who shocks her well-to-do but liberal parents by bringing home unannounced the man she has met and wants to marry, played by Sidney Poitier. This film explores the humor and tension inherent in the confrontation of the woman's parents, played by Spencer Tracy and Katherine Hepburn, with their own hypocritical reservations about the prospect of their precious only daughter marrying a black man. More complexity develops when the man's parents also have trouble accepting the match. The bulk of the dramatic tension results from the excruciating politeness among the characters, especially the members of the older generation. The women, endowed with a superior, almost spiritual sense of common humanity, have far less trouble accepting the interracial couple, ostensibly because of their romantic view of marriage, but one suspects the ulterior motive of wanting to keep the social event running smoothly. The fathers are concerned, on the surface in any case, with the practical difficulties the pair would inevitably encounter, as is even the fiancé. One of the lessons of the movie is that the treatment of all according to the same standard of respect should triumph over specific expectations held by a particular community. The film stood in between the old racial etiquette of segregation and the new social demands of integration. The old etiquette is represented by all the forces aligned against the young couple, including the family's black maid, who makes it known she does not approve of people getting out of their proper places. But there was a foreshadowing of a new etiquette. While the interracial scenes are characterized by extreme politeness, the scenes of Poitier's character alone with his fiancée show him uninhibited and flirtatious. But the best example of changing rules of deference is the speech he delivers to the parents of the young woman. In a strident tone, he informs them that, unbeknownst to his eager would-be bride, he will break off the engagement if the parents cannot promise to give unwavering support of their marriage. 
His reasoning is that the new couple will face so many obstacles that he is not willing to take on any new problems. The young woman's father, played by Spencer Tracy, replies that he respects that decision, but resents its being communicated in the form of an ultimatum. Poitier's character has the last word. It is not an ultimatum, because his fiancé's parents have the power to call the whole thing off. Of course, this would crush her and perhaps sever their tie with their daughter, but the more striking message to the viewer is that the woman means a great deal to the young man, but is not worth everything. Love can conquer most, but not all, not the prospect of continued disrespect from the white parents. In the highly palatable form of Poitier's engaging and confident masculinity, mainstream America was gently initiated into a new style of black assertion. Quietly firm in his demand for respect, Poitier's character adhered to impeccable standards of politeness and civility, and even conviviality. The lesson is that there should be a single standard of good behavior all around. The Masochistic Pleasures of Racial Liberalism Three years later, another work humorously explored the prevailing etiquette between the races, but here the flashes of assertiveness in Poitier's character gave way to a much more demonstrative black style for public interracial encounters, a style that reflected the shift in the black movement from civil rights to vocal black power militancy. Whereas Guess Who's Coming to Dinner questioned the superficiality of a racial liberalism still resting on the premise of social segregation, Tom Wolfe's satirical commentary, Radical Chic and Mau Mauing the Flat Catchers, pierced through the artificiality of an interracial fundraising party thrown for the Black Panthers by the white liberal elite of New York City. Radical Chic ridiculed the new racial order in which interracial harmony was now purchased with abject white submission. Unveiling the white elite's self-interested motives for supporting the black cause, Wolf illustrates its obsession with an etiquette based on white sensitivity to the dictates of blacks who seem to be most authentically black, the Panthers. The host and hostess, Lenny Bernstein, and his wife, Felicia, prove themselves to be geniuses for figuring out how to solve the problem of servants for the Black Panther fundraiser. They hired white South Americans in place of their, quote, Negro butler and maid, Claude and Maude. Quote, Plenty of people have tried to think it out. They try to picture the Panthers or whoever walking in bristling with electric hair and Cuban shades and leather pieces and the rest of it, and they try to picture Claude and Maude with the black uniforms coming up and saying, would you care for a drink, sir? They close their eyes and they try to picture it some way, but there is no way. One simply cannot see that moment, so the current wave of radical chic has touched off the most desperate search for white servants. Wolf's treatment of white liberals exposes their less than admirable motives for embracing the routine of black assertiveness and white submission. Their adherence to the new etiquette serves their own fragile egos and image consciousness. The important thing is to be correct according to their inner, wealthy, radical circle. Correctness in this radical etiquette is what proves that one is authentic, genuine, the real thing. The test of authenticity, ironically, seems to be distance from their own circumscribed and artificial existence. Establishing authenticity thus entails a rejection of this repressed world for one without rules, the world of Norman Mailer's white negro, the white hipster enthralled by black's seeming ability to live in the perpetual climax of the present. Wolf writes that it is nostalgie de la boue, or romanticizing of primitive souls, which was one of the things that brought radical chic to the fore in New York society. Nostalgie de la boue is a 19th century French term that means literally nostalgia for the mud. The nouveau riche, eager to distinguish themselves from the hated middle class, either take on the trappings of aristocracy, such as grand architecture, servants, parterre boxes, and high protocol, or indulge in the gauche thrill of taking on certain styles of the lower orders, or both. Any genuine fellow feeling or egalitarianism is eclipsed by a superficial show of authenticity, a form of total self-absorption that nevertheless hinges on certification by others, and has its own elaborate rituals and protocol. According to the etiquette of this new constellation of social relations, a mere gesture such as the black power symbol, a raised fist denoting exclusive fraternity, danger, and unyielding strength, inspires envy among whites. Because to be black becomes a badge of authenticity, and authenticity is tied with rejection of a world straitjacketed by interdictions, black's behavior gains admiration when it is at its most self-righteously self-assertive, however outlandish, whereas whites can score points only through submission to that authentic expressiveness. That whites need to submit, they must take their turn, is a larger lesson reinforced by many of the prescriptions for interracial conduct that proliferated from the 1960s on. The 1993 film Six Degrees of Separation, from the Broadway play by John Gurr, depicts the rise and fall of a young black man who gains entry into the social world of the New York white liberal elite by mastering his diction and etiquette. With great aplomb, the film's main character, Paul Poitier, played by Will Smith, claiming to be the son of the actor Sidney Poitier, endears himself to the parents of several boarding school friends, armed with inside information received in return for sexual favors for one of their homosexual classmates. In scenes reminiscent of My Fair Lady, the 1964 film based on the stage musical, which in turn drew on Shaw Spignalian, Paul practices articulating bottle of beer instead of slurring it in street dialect, and learns customs such as sending small jars of fancy jams and jellies as a token of gratitude. 
These skills serve Paul well as he worms his way into the hearts of the wealthy whose money-grubbing, status-obsessed lives and alienation from their own spoiled children readied them for the catharsis brought about by friendship with the adoring, attractive young black man. While his presence allows them to unburden themselves of all varieties of guilt and makes them feel young and radical, or at least countercultural again, Paul positions himself to take advantage of the accoutrement of their wealth by using their apartment for sexual adventures and stealing expensive possessions. The manner in which Paul Poitier enters the liberal elite social world through a mastery of its etiquette, including its racial complex, had resonance by the 1990s precisely because the ritual of white liberal guilt and overcompensation had become such a stock feature of the American cultural landscape. In the case of Six Degrees, Paul Poitier plays the race card with a finesse that disarms his rich white victims. Paul's only mistake is his failure to realize that this tack can take him only so far. Liberal guilt runs deep, but exists within a framework of elite prerogative that runs deeper still. Violation of the rules of high society, an essential underpinning of which is the privacy of property, ends up destroying the very illusion of belonging that Paul manages to create through a mastery of its etiquette. Interracial Anxiety A high level of anxiety over interracial etiquette understandably accompanied the prospect of full integration, which symbolized a true revolution in mainstream social arrangements. The attempt by some to assuage this anxiety through a new etiquette of race led to a frenzied attempt to lay out specific pressure points and to itemize particularly sensitive areas of social intercourse. Further nervousness followed not just gross violations of the new interdictions, but at times mere mention of or allusion to them. Each one became part of a kind of social script, according to which it is now hardly even necessary to speak the full name of a particular plank in the etiquette platform. A shorthand reference or allusion will often do. Examples include the notorious phrase, these people, to refer to African Americans or any other minority group. Any slip, however remote, referring to the powers or prowess of animals in conjunction with black athleticism, and any references to the shortcomings of the black family. These and others constitute a new list of taboos that was developed under integration. On the surface, ruling gauche or crude old stereotypical formulations out of polite discourse seems appropriate. How could any well-intentioned enlightened person think otherwise? The problem has less to do with the motivations, which are for the most part good ones, than with the character and broader consequences of their prescriptions, as well as the tack taken to get them across. Minor or idiosyncratic irritants get mixed in with clear racial slurs, doing away with any sense of the importance or method of differentiating between them. This unspoken, invisible list of sensitivities that all enlightened whites are expected to master evokes the same kind of racially differentiated codes that suffused the segregation era, even while it turns them on their head. One of the effects of this new racial etiquette is to give members of different social or ethnic groups the sense that interaction with members of other groups is automatically a minefield. When not discouraging contact altogether, this trepidation can stunt the little communication that does exist. The upshot, the stilted atmosphere of many interracial encounters, has attracted much recent attention, again often through humor. Laura Segal's 1985 novel, Her First American, explores the dynamics of interracial etiquette with a keen eye for the intricacies of human personality and interactions, dynamics still apparent today. In the novel, we encounter the relationship between Ilka Weisnicks, a young Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany, and a black intellectual named Carter Bayou, a brooding, heavy drinker who is significantly older than 21-year-old Ilka. The story is set in the early 1950s, so the civil rights movement has not yet transformed American race relations. Weisnicks, either disarmingly naive or deliberately obtuse, seems to have no knowledge of the American racial taboos or the de facto social guidelines governing black-white relations. Making matters more complicated still, the novel's New York City milieu is largely that of the bohemian intellectual subculture, which was at least in part integrated. This means that while Seagal is ostensibly exploring the racial dynamics under segregation, her observations capture some of the tensions that characterized American society later on. In the decades more directly preceding Seagal's writing of the book, the 1960s and 70s, integration made the norms or dynamics already encountered in the interracial radical subculture of an earlier era more mainstream. The genre thus gives her a way, whether intended or not, to explore indirectly the intricacies of the racial dynamics of integration. Much of the book's plot involves an elaborate dance between Carter Bayou, who is never quite sure what Ilka knows about race and what she feels about him, either as a black man or as a man, and Ilka, who is nearly impossible to read on these matters and whose halting English compounds the problem. For her part, Ilka desperately seeks to find her sea legs in a social world whose racial dimension in particular is unrelentingly new to her. Even Carter's racial identity seems to elude her, despite his pronounced features, which would have been easily recognizable to most Americans. In a key scene, Carter baits Ilka over the issue of racial identification, how members of one group refer to members of another, in a combined attempt to learn something about her and provoke any kind of reaction on the topic of race. They have just attended a wedding reception in a friend's apartment and walked through drizzling rain to a luncheonette, where they begin to converse over coffee. Carter brings up Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, and Ilka gleefully cries that she has read it. Carter comments that the Jew, rich, good-looking, and good athlete, has no sense of protocol, 
which triggers an amusing discussion of racism and racial protocol. Are you anti-Semitish? Ilka surprised herself by asking. Of course, said Carter Bayou. Aren't you? I am a Jew, said Ilka. Then you know more Jews you cannot stand, no? Just as I am anti-more Negroes, a matter of one's opportunity. He is a Negro, Ilka thought. Or does that mean he isn't? You think I am anti-Negroes? Ilka marveled. Of course, give you a test. You're at the wedding and the skinny fellow with the nose asks you, who's that out in the kitchen? Are you going to tell him it's the Negro guzzling Shivas Regal? No, of course not, said Ilka, and thought, so he is a Negro. Of course not, Carter said. Or would you say, it's the Jew in the kitchen? He's Jewish, Ilka thought. No, I don't say that, she said. No, Carter said. You don't say that. You say, it's that guy in the tweed jacket drinking himself into a coma. But say, I'm an Englishman drinking myself into a coma. You'd say, it's that English chap in the kitchen, wouldn't you? But that is different, said Ilka. Yes, said Carter. And Ilka laughed and blushed, embarrassed and bedazzled in the full light of his brown stare on which he held her impaled. Seagal's deft hand both gently mocks Carter's self-obsessed hypersensitivity by giving him the tabula rasa of the immigrant Ilka as a foil, and pierces through Ilka's claims of total ignorance as a defense against differential attitudes. While we cannot see either one as the noble victor, we can surely see the folly of the differential conduct Carter tries to expose. Even though Seagal treats this scene as emblematic of the absurdities of interracial social life, tarnished as they were by layer upon layer of misunderstanding and sensitivity, a growing body of etiquette advice increasingly sought to resolve such everyday anxieties by spelling out the proper rules for behavior. Though the etiquette guides did not always agree on specifics, they nearly always tried to confront the anxieties of interracial interactions under integration with the same overarching message that interracial encounters required a new set of social rules and the overthrow of outmoded notions of general civility. Etiquette for interracial settings needed to be unique, tailored to fit the cultural differences blacks allegedly brought to such settings. A universal code of conduct would not suffice, usually because it failed to recognize the imperatives of black expressiveness. The New Racial Double Standard In the aftermath of the civil rights movement, the new etiquette experts shared two assumptions, that interracial interactions demanded a special set of guidelines, and that blacks and whites needed different treatment. Moreover, these advisors cast white behavior toward blacks in particular as beyond the can of the average citizen and requiring special expertise. The themes of authenticity, emotional expression, and assertiveness ran through the advice literature. In 1971, for example, an actual etiquette guide entitled How to Get Along with Black People, a handbook for white folks and some black folks too, by Sheila Rush and Chris Clark, chastened whites who, in proximity with blacks, misguidedly thought they could be part of a less circumscribed world by socializing and identifying with blacks. In a foreword by Bill Cosby, the reader encounters a scenario in which a white man has a black colleague over for dinner. The evening's development mirrors the scene of social death described by Shelby Steele. Quote, We, my wife and I, invite them, him and his wife, in, and I introduce my wife, who looks very white to me now. I tell them I dig, and my wife says she's hip, but somehow between the pre-dinner cocktails and sitting at the table, they leave. For the life of me, I cannot figure out why. The book goes on to delineate rules for whites on how to conduct themselves properly around blacks, implying that the reasons for the black couple's rejection of the white couple's hospitality was poor interracial etiquette. The book lists faux pas in conversations, such as, he's just the nicest person, he would make it no matter what his color was, and, now especially familiar, one of my closest friends when I was a child was a little colored girl. These and what the authors call other liberalisms come under attack. As for interracial relationships, readers get the impression that these are rarely advised. If both parties find it necessary to pursue the romance, they should discuss racial problems or incidents openly and candidly, but avoid agonizing over them. A sense of humor helps. In addition, quote, whites should exercise restraint in seeking to find out about blacks. While the black partner might appreciate an interest in good food or music preferences, zealous researching into the folk ways of blacks is resented. White women in particular should be careful not to dispute, contradict, or challenge the black partner publicly. They just don't like it, especially coming from a white woman. Very few blacks, male or female, enjoy public displays of affection. End quote. Whites should also avoid black expressions like soul brother, man, right on, dig, getting it together, tell it like it is, and doing your own thing. When deciding what to call blacks, colored, negro, black, or African American, whites should make the decision according to an integration index that typecasts blacks according to their likelihood to endorse integration on the basis of their age, birthplace, skin color, and education. This advice both unveiled the cool style projected by some blacks as a highly self-conscious insouciance and claimed possession of that style. Blacks could say dig and be authentic. Whites who adopted this language were imposters. But if whites insisted on hanging around blacks, they needed to know strict rules for keeping their impulses in line. Cultural Etiquette by Emoja Three Rivers, published 20 years later in 1991, echoed many of the sentiments of how to get along with black people, but took them to even greater extremes. 
In Cultural Etiquette, enthusiastically excerpted in Miss Magazine later in the year it came out, a differential standard had become a guiding principle for propriety under the guise of intercultural tolerance and healing. At times, this became a kind of double standard, according to which the belittling or stereotyping of whites was acceptable, even in a tract condemning such caricaturing of blacks. The pamphlet reduces etiquette to a rigid set of rules seemingly detached from any standard of mutual respect. This separation of etiquette from such a standard creates a need for the elaboration of more and more etiquette rules. Cultural etiquette is an odd mixture of strict commandments and strained definitions whose aim seems to be to claim possession of emotional territory for African Americans. Attacking the stereotype of blacks as having rhythm, the author ends up hinting that they do, not by nature exactly, but because they're more in touch with nature. Quote, Everyone has natural rhythm. It is our human birthright. If you don't have perceptual or neuromuscular impairment, and yet you feel unable to perceive or respond to rhythms in any relevant, satisfying, or graceful way, then perhaps you may want to examine the personal, cultural, and historical paths that led to this unfortunate deficiency. Not having rhythm is not natural. Clearly, the implication is that whites are less natural, less expressive than blacks, even if the condition is only temporary and cultural, and theoretically can be remedied with the right instruction. The larger message of this etiquette advice is that whites need to restrain their impulses and accept black expressions as having nothing to do with whites. Such expressions are the prerogatives of blacks, and any desire to make contact is governed by a strict set of hands-off rules. Besides this strange possessiveness of the terrain of expression, cultural etiquette exhibits a propensity running through this etiquette literature to inflate the importance of behavior all out of proportion to common sense of reality. Touching other people's drums is forbidden, since these objects have strong spirits. One wonders whether the author was aware of the amusing Freudian undertones here. Never touch another person's instruments without asking permission, and do not take it personally if they say no. It is not proper to persevere in the hopes that the instrument's owner will eventually change her mind. She might, if she so desires, but only after she gets to know you better. The touching of hair is also prohibited. The reader receives a definition of dreadlocks and the information that it is not a style, but a cultural, spiritual, and philosophical expression, or an expression of solidarity with other African peoples. Defensive and possessive, the author chides, although straight-haired people can dread, it is an expression that uniquely lends itself to the hair of African people. And just in case you were thinking about it, no, you may not touch it. Don't ask. In a chapter entitled, Just Don't Do This, Okay?, Three Rivers lists a number of interdictions. One should not equate bad, depressing, or negative things with darkness, such as a black mood, a dark day, a black heart. One should neither assume that it is okay to ask people of color about their racial background, nor encroach on the personal space of a person of color or a Jewish person, if one is not already on intimate and equal terms. Perhaps most helpful is this advice. Please don't go around expecting you can be part of another ethnic group now because you feel you were part of that group in a former life. Like its subtitle, A Guide for the Well-Intentioned, Cultural Etiquette's commandments seem geared to readers who consider themselves to be liberal and sympathetic to, or perhaps even honorary members of the group, or wannabes. And some of the pieces of advice make more sense than others, such as the suggestion that in discussing a racist remark, a mere illusion is better than actual repetition. Of course, even this suggestion is not the universal preference of African Americans. The comedian Dick Gregory, for instance, believes one must confront and destroy such language head-on by repeating it and thus wresting it away from the racist context of its original use. The urge to draw boundaries or assert one's presence is one understandable legacy of the racial caste system extant in the United States until as recently as the mid-20th century, the vestiges of which are still present in some places. But basic respect for other people's sense of personal space needs eventually to transcend race, or it may be seen as idiosyncratic, trivial, and one-sided. The pose struck by books like Cultural Etiquette to be the mouthpiece of all people of color lacks credibility and risks painting the whole project of racial civility as either chauvinistic or ridiculous. The decision to enforce sensitivity by endlessly elaborating racially encoded rules of etiquette also evokes those innumerable daily expectations and taboos that once buttressed segregation, which makes it an unfortunate and ultimately disastrous approach. To act colored, the effusive black style. Not all advice on interracial contact aims, of course, to mitigate the pain inflicted by well-intentioned whites. Carla Holloway writes about behavior, particularly of blacks, in the more academic treatise, Codes of Conduct, Race, Ethics, and the Color of Our Character, published in 1995. Just as How to Get Along with Black People and Cultural Etiquette warned whites not to mistake an effusive black style for a relaxation of social guidelines, Codes of Conduct chastised blacks who failed to project an uninhibited sensibility. In this line of thought, expressiveness emerges as highly self-conscious, codified, and guided by an etiquette of its own. Commenting on everything from court cases to novels and films, Holloway sets up a code of conduct by which she judges other blacks. She scolds Whoopi Goldberg for compromising her passionate self-embrace by carrying on an interracial romance with Ted Danson, and supporting his appearance at a friars club roast for her, at which he appeared in blackface and joked about her sexual appetites. 
Though Goldberg said she had approved of Danson's jokes as humor, Holloway commands, black talk has to be a consistent and passionate articulation. Maya Angelou also comes under attack for speaking her poem On the Pulse of the Morning at the first presidential inauguration of Bill Clinton. Since Angelou had customarily delivered her poems with much expression and gesticulation, she disappointed many blacks, according to Holloway, for breaking a kind of African-American cultural code. When Angelou did not step or gesture, when she did not move at all around the small space of the inaugural platform, and especially when she did not modulate or culturate her voice, African-Americans like me felt quite keenly the loss of those cultural codes that could have marked the moment. Similarly, Anita Hill garners disapproval for her self-control. Holloway would have preferred her to churn it out, a term that means to unleash the anger and frustration appropriate to a demanding situation, to act colored. Holloway quotes the feminist scholar Bell Hooks' assertion that instead of integrity, Hill's behavior exemplified to many just another example of black female stoicism in the face of sexist or racist abuse. If Hill had allowed herself to become passionate, the hearings would have been less an assault on the psyches of black females watching, according to Hooks. Holloway admits that she hesitates to endorse behavior such as turning it out on the grounds that it might reinforce the various stereotypes blacks have fought for so many years to counteract. When one member of her book club, the Friday Night Women, asked the others if they had ever had to turn it out, quote, the tenor of the night's discussion changed, she wrote, as we alternately shared the hilarity of the moments when we just decided to go on and act colored, as some of us called it, and we also relived the pain of us all having had that same experience. In one sense, churning it out or acting colored means that we give up trying to respond to a situation as if both we and they, white people and or men, are operating within the same codes of conduct. It can mean handing over to our adversary our version of the stereotype that motivates their disrespect to us. Turning it out involves losing control, unleashing anger, acting obstinate and unreasonable, all of the things unfairly constituting long-standing stereotypes of black female behavior, exactly those limited preconceptions underlying the insult that triggered turning it out in the first place. The result, Holloway admits, is that no one wins, but usually we feel better, she adds. Black Rage The notion of special prerogatives for blacks' behavior was buttressed by the more formal invective of the late 20th century. As popularized through the etiquette guides, this invective contributed, ironically, to a narrowing of the emotional possibilities under integration. In the course of the 1960s, the range of emotional experiences made possible by the collapse of older interdictions against black self-expression were curtailed. Black assertiveness was increasingly funneled into either black rage or black self-affirmation, a new genre of quasi-confessional racial harangue in which blacks let flow a range of emotions and admissions concerning the American racial scene helped redefine assertion as rage. This stylized genre was validated by the anti-authoritarian climate of the age, in which personal testimony enjoyed newfound respect for its emotional immediacy and, again, its supposed authenticity. The confessional harangue tended to lack logical organization, taking on the loose form associated with journal writing or even resorting to stream-of-consciousness ramblings or self-disclosure. In The Fire Next Time, for instance, James Baldwin largely eschewed his usual complicated insights into the human condition for an angry stream-of-consciousness polemic against what had already, by the time he wrote it in 1963, been widely acknowledged by most Americans as the undeniable outrage of racial oppression. His tirade contained a threat that if whites did not end the evil of racism, retribution would come in the form of the fire next time. Continued intransigence and ignorance by whites would lead to a vengeance that does not really depend on and cannot really be executed by any person or organization, and that cannot be prevented by any police force or army, historical vengeance, a cosmic vengeance. Blacks needed to exact this vengeance, quote, at no matter what risk, eviction, imprisonment, torture, death. Though the book begins with a letter from Baldwin to his nephew, he clearly intends his book as a warning to whites. He asserts that everything white Americans think they believe in must now be re-examined, and threatens a solidified black force for revolutionary change. Quote, what one would not like to see again is the consolidation of peoples on the basis of their color. But as long as we in the West place on color the value that we do, we make it impossible for the great unwashed to consolidate themselves according to any other principle. The Fire Next Time undoubtedly reached a white audience as well as a black one, helping it to earn rave reviews from all the major publications and become a bestseller. In an interview with the scholar William Banks, the writer Ishmael Reed saw the intentions of Baldwin's book as those of a whole genre of black writing aimed as much at whites as at blacks. Quote, I see some of these books that come out, and I know to whom they are directed. You can always tell when the narrator becomes an anthropologist and starts explaining black folkways in their books. That's a sign. It's a tip-off because blacks know them already. Who are they writing for? I think Baldwin plays the role, a guide. He will take time out to get a footnote to explain to the white reader what's going on. Because his audience is a white middle-class audience. There are always going to be millions of liberals who read in this country, and that's his audience. Of course, Baldwin isn't the only one who does this, end quote. Obviously, blacks' rage over racial injustice had a history as long as their systematic racial exploitation on American soil. One can hardly question its legitimacy. 
From Daniel Walker's openly threatening appeal to Richard Wright's implicit warning in Native Son, published in 1945, the expression of black rage had a major role in mobilizing the armies of change. But as the civil rights movement gained momentum and achieved stunning successes in the late 1950s and early 1960s, expressions of rage gained unprecedented exposure and new meaning. Though often compelling, even justifiable, such expressions soon became a mode or style with a life of its own. While presented as a kind of authentic black voice or rising consciousness of oppression, the expressions of rage drew their significance from a real or presumed interracial audience, as Ishmael Reed's comment about Baldwin's audience suggests. The Black Panther, Eldridge Cleaver's Soul on Ice, was one of a number of works that rested on the new legitimacy of unrestrained emotional venting. Its popularity indicated Americans' growing penchant for extremity in African-American expression. The book explores, in part, the course Cleaver took from serving time in 1954 for possession of marijuana, when, in his telling, his consciousness of racial oppression was forged, to his transformation into a rapist, and then his incarceration in Folsom Prison. Cleaver by no means approves of the path he took in life, but the overriding message of his book is that distorted race relations in the United States created the conditions in which he could come to view the rape of white women as an insurrectionary act. The line between excuse and explanation is a tricky one, made even murkier in a genre whose very essence seems a combination of emotional purging and invective. His account of the political intent of his rapes ends movingly when he admits, I was wrong, I had gone astray. But Cleaver's analysis fails to explore factors other than white racism in his reprehensible behavior, and thus is unable to broach the question of why most black men do not rape white women. And his recounting of his initial motivation continues to carry an implied threat. Quote, it delighted me that I was defying and trampling upon the white man's law, upon his system of values, and that I was defiling his women. And this point, I believe, was the most satisfying to me because I was very resentful over the historical fact of how the white man has used the black woman. I felt I was getting revenge. Cleaver quotes now infamous lines from Leroy Jones' dead lecturer, rape the white girls, rape their fathers, cut the mother's throats, and proceeds, I have lived those lines, and I know that if I had not been apprehended, I would have slit some white throats. There are, of course, many young blacks out there right now who are slitting white throats and raping the white girl. They are not doing this because they read Leroy Jones' poetry, as some of his critics seem to believe. Rather, Leroy is expressing the funky facts of life, end quote. The funky facts of life that led to the attitude encapsulated in Leroy's lines are those that led Cleaver to become possessed by evil urges. The reason he took up writing, he says, was to save himself by unraveling the snarled web of his motivations. Quote, I understood that what had happened to me had also happened to countless other blacks, and it would happen to many, many more. Throughout the book, Cleaver expresses intense feelings for his white lawyer, Beverly Axelrod, and even sees their relationship as part of the larger crumbling of barriers between blacks and whites. We are mere parts of a complex movement, he writes, we represent historical forces, and it is really these forces that are coalescing and moving toward each other. Yet, by the end of the book, Cleaver's cure for the sickness that he claims drove him to his career as a rapist is to forsake the allure of the white female as the ultimate object of beauty and desire. Instead, he will revolt against racial oppression by uniting with black women. Addressing Queen, Mother, Daughter of Africa, My Eternal Love, he casts this union as an expressly sexual one. Quote, let me drink from the river of your love at its source. Let the lines of force of your love seize my soul by its core and heal the wound of my castration. Let my convex exile end its haunted odyssey in your concave essence, which receives that it may give. The answer to past racist wrongs seems to Cleaver to be sexual union between blacks, for only through sexual union will black men and black women begin to heal the wounds of racism. Sex, in fact, takes on a crucial role here, because only liberation from the cerebral ways of whites, according to Cleaver, can offer any escape from the chains of slavery. According to a typology he constructs to illustrate the social structures of racial discrimination, white men retain power over blacks by casting themselves as the omnipotent administrator and black men as the supermasculine menial. While his point is that whites have used this dichotomy to their advantage by maintaining power and control in society, he ends up accepting the image of blacks as more physical. Cleaver finds the greatest hope of the 1960s to be white youths who attempted to celebrate the body as he thinks blacks do. Ultimately, expressiveness becomes an end in itself, which to Cleaver means sexual expression above all. The only better world Cleaver can envision is one in which sex takes on the role of historical healer. Before mainstream white popular culture embraced black expressiveness in the 1950s and 1960s, particularly in the form of music or dances like The Twist, America was cold and sexless, according to Cleaver. He elevates emotional expression to launch a compelling attack on the rationalization of modern life. Quote, the increasingly mechanized, automated, cybernated environment, a cold, bodiless world of wheels, smooth plastic surfaces, tubes, push buttons, transistors, computers, jet propulsion, rockets to the moon, atomic energy. Yet, by seeing this rationalization purely as a racial matter, a legacy of racial segregation, he falls short of offering a compelling alternative. Instead, he prescribes a reunion of America's mind with its body to save its soul, which would draw on Black's supposed affinity with nature. 
Quote, it is in this connection that the blacks personifying the body and thereby in closer communion with their biological roots than other Americans provide the saving link, the bridge between man's biology and man's machines. His acceptance of the depiction of blacks is more sexual. He embraces Mailer's white negro and attacks Baldwin's violent repudiation of Mailer's piece as a sign of Baldwin's hatred of blacks, ironically works against his very effort to do away with the image of the supermasculine menial black man. Using black hypersexuality as a model to be extended to the rest of society, he equates freedom from sexual and psychic repression with social equality. Quote, People are feverishly and at great psychic and social expense seeking fundamental and irrevocable liberation, and what is more important, are succeeding in escaping from the big white lies that compose the monolithic myth of white supremacy and black inferiority in a desperate attempt on the part of a new generation of white Americans to enter into the cosmopolitan egalitarian spirit of the 20th century. Cleaver's treatise presented a model of black expressiveness and uninhibitedness that others would repeat throughout the century. Many later observers lacked Cleaver's passion and perception, but shared a notion his writings helped put into common currency, the idea that rage, or at least unapologetic self-assertion, was the legitimate, perhaps the only legitimate, response blacks should have to the racial situation in America. These writers treated black's situation as the result of a monolithic, unchanging original sin that explained and justified the attenuation of rage, despite any ostensible gains for civil rights. Their works often shared other qualities of Cleaver's harangue, they attributed heightened expressiveness to blacks as a group, adopted a stream-of-consciousness mode or another form of personal disclosure, and criticized blacks who failed to adopt this model of uninhibited self-disclosure or self-expression as traitorous, self-hating, or somehow not black at all. Stylized Rage Ralph Wiley's Why Black People Tend to Shout, Cold Facts and Wry Views from a Black Man's World, published in 1991, shared all of these tendencies. Whiteley, however, was either too far removed from the cauldron that made Cleaver's analysis boil, too impatient, or just unable to offer any real analysis. Instead, he briefly treated each item in an erratic list of subjects. By the time he came to it, the harangue confessional could be seen as a predictable script a la Cleaver on the Black Rage theme. Wiley's treatise spews forth its venom on major events and minor idiosyncrasies with equal force, giving the very impression of uncontrolled expression that the book's main purpose is to justify. Wiley focuses on the reasons black people tend to shout, subtly dismissing any questions about whether such a generalization is accurate in the first place. Black people tend to shout in churches, movie theaters, and anywhere else they feel the need to shout, he says, because when joy, pain, anger, confusion, and frustration, ego and thought mix it up the way they do inside black people, the uproar is too big to hold inside. The feeling must be aired. After establishing the unique condition of universal black expressiveness, Wiley invokes the entire legacy of racial oppression as a still extant force, drawing an implicit comparison between the egregious wrongs of slavery and the incidents he relates throughout the book. Blacks revel in the very luxury of being able to express themselves openly, given all the cruelty they as a people have endured. From this opening, which calls up the worst horrors of a truly horrific day, Wiley leads us to lesser questions, such as the one treated in a section called What Black People Won't Eat. Issue after issue comes up in a way that appears random, until one realizes that the book is intended as a kind of etiquette manual for whites, and scene after scene gains brief treatment but lacks any clear argument or resolution until one realizes that Wiley's central endeavor is to list all of the matters he can which might anger blacks. His goal seems to be to make whites aware of all possible areas of sensitivity. The food passage is illustrative. Wiley jokes that a sure way to provoke a black person is to try to introduce the idea of eating something that strikes him or her as unpalatable. The imagined scenario goes like this. Try some of this. What is it? Meat. What kind of meat? Lamb, I think. I don't eat lamb. But it's good. I said I don't eat lamb. Have you ever had lamb? No. Then how do you know you don't like it? I didn't say I don't like it. I said I don't eat it. I like my dog, but I wouldn't eat her either. Got any steak? Further probing could result in receiving a blow, Wiley concludes. What is the moral of the story? Never assume. In another section, reminiscent of Cleaver's dismissal of Baldwin as self-hating, Wiley attacks Julian Bond, the civil rights veteran and now NAACP chairman, for not confronting more rigorously David Duke, the Louisiana politician who was a former Ku Klux Klansman and founder of the National Association for the Advancement of White People. Sure, Julian's aim was to bring into the open Duke's racism by questioning Duke's past actions and words, but Bond fell far short of the attack Wiley thinks he himself would have made. Wiley says he could have unmasked Duke by asking only one key question. After six sentences and four questions, Wiley finally delivers his clincher, if Duke could achieve what Wiley says is Duke's ideal society, nearly all white but with a small number of blacks to do the menial and mental labor, then, Wiley hypothetically asks Duke, what would you do? What would you create? You'd have Mr. Duke there because he is apparently short on talent, Wiley concludes, apparently assuming that the cause of racism is a lack of real creativity or ability. 
That Bond did not pose this question, Wiley suggests, shows that he is only black under certain lights. Julian is black according to the rules of the deciders, but since he did not think to ask Wiley's question, Wiley does not know what to make of him anymore. The same treatment. A whole body of etiquette advice and stream of consciousness confessional literature thus openly encourages a double standard of heightened sensitivity for whites and uninhibited confrontation or expression for true blacks, and more academic works add their seal of approval. Such works reinforce our sense that different etiquette rules and different standards for behavior are proper and legitimate, either because of the cultural differences between blacks and whites, or because of the historical treatment of blacks in this country. This history of racial discrimination and exploitation cannot be denied, nor should it ever be. Yet not everyone, not even every etiquette advisor, accepts historical treatment of blacks as a mandate for a double standard of conduct. An otherwise rather innocuous etiquette book aimed at a black audience, Basic Black, Home Training for Modern Times, published in 1996, is notable for its departure from the racially tinged etiquette games discussed earlier. This book firmly advises its readers to adhere to a single overarching standard of good conduct. Despite the unique demands of the black experience in America, and partly because of it, blacks need to practice what used to be called home training. The authors Karen Grigsby Bates and Karen Elise Hudson describe home training as traditional African-American understandings of good manners or politeness as rooted in the education, instruction, or discipline of a person in accepted mores or values reflecting proper rearing and denoting correct breeding. Basic Black goes on to make an unyielding case for a single standard of conduct, which the authors stress has to do with more than simply arcane etiquette rules. It involves rather a whole posture toward social life that rests on a deep sense of civility and mutual respect. Good manners, Bates and Hudson argue, transcend social status, race, and gender. While they manifest themselves in particular etiquette rules, they embody a larger principle of respect for others. Quote, all major religions have a simple phrase that distills what good manners are, doing unto others as you would like others to do unto you. This golden rule applies to friendships, workplace relationships, romances, and family interaction, virtually all human relationships." End quote. The authors discourage particular tendencies they see as counterproductive. An example they give is the use of chronic excuses for lateness under the inner rationalization that once people live according to a slower pace. Instead, it is vital to adhere to an overarching standard of respectful behavior. Quote, Act your age, not your color, used to be how some folks reminded others that the world expected lesser standards of us because of our race. When we behaved poorly, we were acting like, well, you know. And when we behaved well, we were considered a credit to our race. Both phrases assumed that black people were one big population, one lump in stereotype. Good behavior, like manners, transcends race, gender, and even age. Reflecting well on oneself should be the rule of thumb." End quote. Specifically treating the issue of the different cultures and ethnicities that help make the United States such a vibrant country, Bates and Hudson refused to get caught up in elaborating a separate code of conduct for different social situations depending on their racial or ethnic composition. Acknowledging that behavior considered proper by one cultural group could be taboo in another, they nevertheless suggest that an overarching set of guidelines can negotiate such differences smoothly in the American context. When in doubt of the customs of a particular group, they state simply, it's always a good idea to ask. For example, My Lee, when we go to your sister's wedding next Saturday, how should we dress? Robin, do women have to have their heads covered to visit your mosque? Overly detailed itemizing of different etiquette rules for interracial settings betrays cynicism about the potential for and willingness of individuals from different backgrounds to learn and want to learn about one another in social intercourse. Bates and Hudson instead harbor a basic hopefulness that causes them to be able to say with quiet assurance, quote, the key is to be as sensitive to another's culture traditions as we would want others to be to ours. Absent is the ritual thrashing of dominant middle-class norms, those often assumed to be specifically those of whites, everywhere apparent in the words of those involved in the ritual of white submission and black assertiveness. These advisors are not the only ones to emphasize the need for a universal standard of respect. Social critics who argue that we are in the midst of a larger crisis of civility show that this crisis has occurred in part because we are unclear about the principles undergirding our relations with others. From the etiquette advisor and astute social commentator Judith Martin, alias Miss Manners, to the Yale law professor Stephen Carter, those who see a large-scale rudeness crisis as a significant part of the contemporary landscape point to etiquette as a vital part of democratic life, but insist on the need to recover our sense of the moral underpinnings of such an etiquette to help us govern social life according to the dictates of egalitarianism. The historian Rochelle Gerstein goes even further to warn us that an overemphasis on mere politeness arose in the 19th century as a replacement for civic virtue as the new commercialism gave priority to individual freedom over public spiritedness. Other social critics, including the political philosopher Jean Bethke Elstein, have linked the decline in civility to our waning sense of the collective good and the coarsening of public life that results in the absence of any distinction between private and public interests. 
Restoration of basic civility would require recapturing a sense of collective purpose beyond individual self-interest, which in turn would entail resisting the ways that social relations have been molded according to the dictates of the economic sphere. It would also rely on a renewal of open democratic debate and deliberation, lest the imperatives of civility be corrupted for the sake of crushing dissent. Self-conscious informality, the economic imperative. The new racial etiquette makes it appear that white self-control is mandated by the racial past and that black expressiveness is authentic release from that past. But the proliferation of expert advice spelling out the need for different roles for blacks and whites unveils the embrace of supposedly spontaneous, unleashed emotionalism as highly stylized, conscious, and preconceived. The received wisdom is that life has become increasingly informal as strict social hierarchies have been dismantled over the last century. But some historians of 20th century American emotional life have pointed out that in some ways demands on self-control have increased. The new fluidity of social life coming with increased opportunities for social mobility and democratization movements and new corporate work climates actually called for new kinds of emotional control. While particular traditions of self-discipline and sublimation tied to the work ethic may have eroded, new codes of behavior have arisen. Turning to the 19th and 20th centuries, the historians John Casson and Cass Woters build on what the sociologist Norbert Elias has revealed to be a long-term trend toward greater emotional control as the modern liberal nation-state relied on self-discipline more than outright force to maintain order. The ideas of these scholars shed light on the late 20th century reemergence of the etiquette anxiety seen in the movies and etiquette guides cited earlier. Casson argues that the rise of bourgeois refinement over the course of the 19th century resulted from urbanization, the advancement of capitalism, and heightened geographical and social mobility. These conditions caused middle-class Americans to create public identities that served their economic and social interests. 20th century consumerism only heightened the degree to which individuals sought to control their emotions in order to compete in the marketplace by gaining cultural capital through the projection of particular images. The etiquette of refinement paralleled the new segmentation of the self, which resulted from the imperative of rehearsing theatrical parts for public consumption. The basis for any solidity of the self eroded in a climate in which facades, possessions, and other external signs of worth dominated daily life. Other scholars have similarly charted the heightening of expectations for self-control in modern life, sometimes drawing on a more explicit connection with economic motivations. In their study of the history of anger, Carol Zizowitz Stearns and Peter Stearns cite everything from social fluidity, democratization, and population growth to the rise of investment capitalism as factors in the increasingly stringent requirements for the repression of anger. But a large part of their book, Anger, the Struggle for Emotional Control in America's History, involves a discussion of the rise of the human relations programs in early 20th century American industries, through which managers sought to deflect emotion from the job site to the personal realm, suggesting that a primary imperative for the shift in emotional style was economic. Management had a direct interest in restricting outbursts, and through an onslaught of programs, such as counseling services and sensitivity training, directed employees' behavior, quote, toward a style more suitable for corporate and service sector behavior. The sociologist Arlie Hothschild's The Managed Heart also emphasizes the role of the service industries in demanding so much emotional exertion from certain employees that they become alienated from their own feelings. The whole apparatus of training programs and advice intruded between their impulses and their actual expressions. Both anger and the managed heart point to the 20th century work world's demand for emotional control. This perspective raises the question of the connection between the fascination with etiquette in the late 20th century and the imperatives of the economic sphere. With the rise of the black middle class since the civil rights movement, as well as with the globalization of the economy, businesses stood increasingly to lose from the alienation of blacks as customers and even on occasion as workers. Economic imperatives, of course, were tangled with legal ones, which managers could neglect in an increasingly litigious society only at their peril. The need to court those of different backgrounds with ultra-sensitive etiquette is in some cases directly related to the impulse to constrict emotions for the sake of better business and more controllable workplaces and market transactions. Hothschild speaks of the workplace requirement for flight attendants, for example, to suppress their genuine emotions and to force other ones to surface. The Lucas Guide, an organ that ranked the quality of service on airlines, delivered high praise in one case in these terms. The atmosphere was that of a civilized party, with the passengers in response behaving like civilized guests. The economic utility of etiquette is declared up front in some contemporary etiquette guides, which frankly posit that failure to master the new diversity etiquette will hurt business. A 1996 guide entitled Multicultural Manners tells readers how they might use the book. Quote, if you work in marketing, for example, and are looking for ways to expand your customer base among ethnic groups, you might check the index heading of a particular group and read the listed entries to find out what would or would not be congruent with their values and customers. This might help you to reach your target market more effectively. Because people often realize their mistakes too late, 
Sometimes multicultural manners will be consulted after the fact to find out what went wrong. Let's say you sell real estate and you've had difficulty in closing sales with Chinese clients. You could look under Chinese and discover a feng shui entry that would unlock the mystery and explain the reluctance of your customers to purchase certain houses or commercial properties. You would discover ancient Chinese beliefs that influence contemporary purchasing decisions. That would give you clues as to how to salvage future sales." End quote. In his attempt to make sense out of the California dinner party he describes so beautifully, Shelby Steele interprets the harangue flagellation ritual as being a result of a historical shift away from the moral basis of early civil rights agitation and a byproduct of the psychological tensions of racial integration. First, the civil rights movement, in his eyes, made such huge strides precisely because it sought to sever any tie between race and power. Its underlying moral principle was that, quote, in this society, race must not be a source of advantage or disadvantage for anyone. And the movement rested on the assumption that whites had at least the capacity to act morally on this and every other score. The black power movement instead revived the use of race as an avenue to power, thus, quote, affirming the very union of race and power it was born to redress. The problem with this ritualistic power play is not only that it perpetuates divisiveness and the differential codes of behavior we should be rid of by now, but also that it is at root a charade, a replacement for a real change in the allotment of social authority or redistribution of wealth or power. In many ways, whites have given in to the assertions of blacks in the realm of expression because such assertions can be entertaining and cathartic, as we saw in the seductions of Cuba Gooding's rhythmic dance and calls. But this charade of expiation exacts no price. When we still face many real challenges resulting from this nation's racial crimes, this ritual represents a classic diversion. It sidetracks us from the genuine civil rights vision of democratic universalism and substitutes role reversal for egalitarianism. And whenever we allow our sights to move off our egalitarian ideal, our best hopes for a multiracial democratic community flounder. Only by seeing this racial drama in the context of larger cultural changes can we grasp how it presents a diversion from the key issues of our day. As we will see, the diversity etiquette all too well fits the economic imperative for smooth relations at work in the pursuit of productivity and business dealings, as well as smooth relations with consumers in the pursuit of profit. This set of roles demands a level of self-control, but what is crucial is the particular type of control that is demanded. As set forth, the rules necessitate a funneling of emotion into acceptable terms of expression. While sometimes jarring and divisive, Emotional expressiveness on the part of some blacks, or alternatively, obsequiousness on the part of whites, does not really threaten the fundamental structures of work or society. Black expressiveness provides an outlet but not a cure, and white submission channels racial feeling but does not cause it to subside. While all societies have forms of self-control, etiquette, and sublimation, the particular contours these follow reveal a great deal about the culture involved. Social scripts can serve to contain dissent and difference, even social scripts based on difference. Shelby Steele speaks of the delinquent's delight he took in provoking whites on race issues. It was part of the adolescent impulse to sneer at convention. Although Steele managed to put this role behind him, as a culture we have not. Unlike Steele, who denies himself the transitory boost the ritual could give him when his self-esteem ebbs in integrated settings, a whole host of etiquette gurus support our decision to give in to our most theatrical impulses.